and um, we are not going to have too many changes this year, but one of the things we are going to try to do, and I'll let uh, Mayor Hibbert lead us in the pledge before we get started with the meeting. Will you join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Uh, okay, I just have a couple comments I wanted to make uh, since there's only one first meeting. And, uh, and so, good morning. I'm so glad to be here. Really, honestly, this is going to be a, a great opportunity for me to learn uh, this year. And I really wanted to thank each of you for the expertise that you guys are bringing to Pinellas County. Huge, huge. And I uh, just also wanted to say uh, to each of you um, individually, um, I'm sorry for the business this past year and the, and, the, and the impacts that COVID has had on each of your businesses. We're keenly aware of that around the county with businesses and what they're suffering and going through. So you all are no exception. And I know each of you are still here and still committing your time to Pinellas County. So I wanted to say thank you. Also wanted to say thank you to the staff who has done multiple jobs this year. It's not just trying to keep things going here, but also doing other jobs in and around the county, as many of the county employees have done. Um, so, um, so I just wrote, I couldn't be more proud of, of this group, but also the other uh, county employees who have done so much. So thank you for that. Um, looking forward to the strategic planning process. I think it's cr super critical that we're doing that. I think this is a great year to be focusing on that. So looking forward to participating and then kind of unraveling the results to see what elements we're going to change because change is inevitable you know if we don't change uh you know we just kind of flounder around so there will be changes and i'm sure that we'll we'll deal with those as we go along um also when i was talking to michael we were just looking back over the last few years and on, on a couple things one is we did some real efforts here uh, on bylaws several years ago i don't remember how long and i think you're gonna you're gonna talk about that later or not i don't not, not, no, anyway, we, we've had some input on that. You guys have. We, we never dealt with it at the, uh, at the county commission. So I thought maybe at some point during the year we'd take a look at them again, see if we wanted to make any other adjustments, and then send it back to the county uh, commissioners for, for their approval. The other piece um, is the TDC plan, which I think at this point we've decided not to open up, or some years ago we decided not to open that up, uh, and probably that'll kind of come out of that strategic planning process. Do we, you know, you know, do we want to open that up and take a look at pieces of it that we can use uh, funds for? Uh, we'll see how that goes. But I think that's a part of the process that the state allowed, and so far we haven't taken advantage. It's always good to kind of take a look at that. Um, um, and finally, I just, in, in just looking back, um, <laughs> I, I, as I said, I really admire the folks around this table and your predecessors, and uh, I don't always agree with you guys. I think a few years ago when we went 5 to 6 percent, I didn't agree with that. Um, I didn't agree with the firmness of that 60-40 split, and, um, and, and uh, yet when I look back on it, I'm really glad to say that I wasn't right, or probably better said, I was probably wrong in those positions, um, because I really think that the things that you all have done really have helped our residents ultimately helping our businesses that are out there on the beaches but also our residents is critically important and both of those decisions really did that and so i, I just wanted to make that comment as well and uh with that we'll go ahead and get started with the meeting i didn't have any other comments to make but uh just a few things to start the year off so we'll go straight to the approval of the minutes anybody have any questions or comments move approval okay Second. Okay. <clears throat> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And now we have an opportunity for anybody here in uh, that wants to make any comments to the board, any public comments? Anybody in the room? Nope. Nobody signed up? Okay. We'll move right on then to our tourism industry updates. And I guess, Steve, we're going to go to the, to the airport. Go. It's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And our uh, first speaker today is uh, Tom Jewsbury from St. Pete Clearwater International Airport. And I'm excited to be working with these guys and the, the great things that they have going out there. 
This comes as a comment from our last TDC meeting. We said, hey, can we just get an idea of what's happening? Um, the folks from Tampa International were not able to make this meeting, but will be at the next one. So that way we have an idea of what's happening from an airline passenger standpoint. And, uh, and I know PI has been leading, leading in the efforts of recovery, which is awesome news for us, but I look forward to the report. Tom? And Great. Jeff. Thank you. Good morning, Steve. And uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Eggers and the uh, board of the TDC. Um, last time we presented was about a year ago, I think in February, when things were looking uh, bright uh, before uh, the weeks ahead where we saw the impacts of COVID. Um, we do have a presentation for you this morning. Uh, as I told Steve, I promised to knock it down from an hour and a half to an hour, so we're committed to uh, <laughs> meeting that goal. Uh, no, we are uh, we're going to present, if I didn't introduce myself, uh, Tom Jewsbury, Executive Director of the St. Pete Clearwater Airport, and with me is as most of you here know, uh, Jeff Klaus, uh, Director of Air Service Development. So we're going to do a tag team presentation uh, for you this morning. Uh, we'll go through the slides and certainly uh, spend as much time as you'd like uh, answering questions. And uh, glad to do that. So with that said, uh, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you and pick it up at the end. Okay. Morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Um, good morning. Certainly a good question to ask, you know, what's going on at the airports? Uh, so what I've tried to do is put together some data to help explain kind of how we fared through 2020. Um, this first data set, uh, which was available, most current data from January through September of uh, 2020, shows that we at PI had the second lowest capacity change in Florida with the available seats down just 9% and the rest of Florida averaging down 40%. The second data set uh, actually shows TSA throughput data, which is passengers through the checkpoints. And it's more current in real time, so I was able to capture that for the entire year of 2020. Um, so there again, you'll see that we had the fifth best 2020 passenger change of all airports in Florida, and the best change of any airport with 2 million plus passengers. So again, down 40%, but that is actually passengers through the checkpoint. This next slide shows that we filled 60% of our available airline seats, uh, with, uh, which was right on uh, the Florida average. But it's more impressive than the actual percentage total there because as I told you, uh, we were, had the second lowest capacity change of all the airports in Florida. So while we are right on average at 60%, the actual people in seats uh, was more impressive than, than that total shows. This last data set kind of gives you a glimpse as to what we have in store coming up for 2021. Because Allegiance schedule is already posted and available for sale up until August 1st, um, we were able to kind of look ahead again and look at capacity and how that compared to 2020 and certainly 2019. And I'm very pleased to say that our capacity is there. So if you look at the seats year over year compared to 2019 peak, the capacity is there. It's available for sale. It's a matter of getting people uh, to fly and comfortable to fly and backfilling those seats and enjoying our beautiful destination. Uh, this next slide kind of gives a snapshot. We'll go back in time. Again, from 2010 really to 2019, uh, we, we just had phenomenal years, setting records year over year, up 195%. 2019 was certainly a year to break all records for us. Fourth consecutive year of breaking all-time passenger records. Uh, we had the biggest month in our history back in July of 2019. Uh, we were the ninth busiest Florida uh, airport of 20 commercial service airports. Um, so we were on quite the roll. And then, of course, 2020 happened, and we all know uh, that we all saw impacts from certainly COVID. Uh, we finished, unfortunately, down 39%, which, again, comparatively speaking, uh, was much better than many of our counterparts around the country. Uh, so we're not entirely displeased. Being down 39% certainly would hope to do better going into 2021. So where are we to date? With Allegiant, we have 52 uh, cities, primarily in the, in the Northeast, Midwest, Southeast. Um, we did announce new service through the pandemic. It's new service to Fargo, uh, begins February 11th. And as I say Fargo, I know it's not as exciting as maybe nonstop service to Hawaii or, or to Las Vegas, but what is exciting is 
almost 100% of the people that are on those flights are inbound to this destination to enjoy our award-winning uh, our award-winning beaches and and destinations. Like I said, uh, that's certainly exciting because that puts uh, heads in beds. Sun Country, which has charter service to Beau Rivage, has really been an excellent partner for us. Really, over the past 14 years, um, it's just been excellent. They've they've held in there with us. As you know, casinos have really taken a hit during this time as well. But they, they manage to hang in there and offer between eight and 10 flights a week, which is excellent service. We appreciate that. This kind of shows a snapshot again of all the cities that we have nonstop service to. Uh, I have to give a shout out to Sunwing. I mean, God bless them. They were holding on to providing seasonal service, which typically begins in February to Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, the east eastern sector of, of Canada has was for a while kind of least impacted by the pandemic. So we were holding out hope that we could offer that service still from Canada and be international. But unfortunately, as you may have seen yesterday, uh, the prime minister had even ordered to their people, the Canadian citizens, if you have trips, cancel them, um, whether they're vacation or otherwise. And so obviously for those reasons and the border closures, we just can't offer that service. So unfortunately, recently, we made the decision that we cannot offer the Halifax service. So in essence, we are at 53 cities of nonstop service. But uh, again, hopeful that everything turns around as everybody does in this room and, and next year we'll have that Canadian service back again. Appreciate that, uh, thank you, Jeff. You know, one of the interesting facts too, we just, you know, we're starting to get all the numbers in from 2020 and uh, with the number of passengers that we served, especially specifically with Allegiant, as you may know, we've always been uh, sitting at uh, third place as far as the most passengers for Legion behind Orlando Sanford in Las Vegas. Well, actually this year we surpassed Las Vegas. So um, uh, we've always really been about a million passengers behind Orlando Sanford, the number one spot. This year we're only behind by less than 200,000. So there is the potential that we could potentially surpass that all depending on how fast the attractions come back in the Orlando area. So uh, some, some interesting comparisons. Um, I wanted to focus this part of the presentation really on um, operational impacts, uh, what's been happening, or how our capital and, and improvement plan has been impacted by COVID. Uh, on the slide of COVID, we were amongst other uh, airports throughout the nation really once the first to try to implement a lot of these safety measures, ones that are now commonplace that you see, the increased sanitization, the cleaning, the distant measuring with a, uh, floor markings, uh, plexiglass, um, hand sanitizer. We even have uh, free masks as you come into the airport to try to promote that. So the biggest, the biggest push there was, was two things. To go ahead and instill passenger confidence that the terminal environment was safe and at the same time, try and instill passenger confidence to come back and fly. Um, and that was a, a message that not just uh, a PI was trying to push, but all airports uh, throughout the nation. Again, building that passenger confidence. So despite all the impacts we saw with COVID and the decline in uh, passenger traffic, we still had a commitment from our concessionaires. Uh, we do had a new concession agreement that just came on board earlier that year, um, and they have pushed through. Uh, they did uh, completion on several uh, concessions. Uh, the biggest one that we had a, uh, a ribbon cutting for was uh, Mazzaro's. Um, we also have introduced uh, several uh, gift shops. Um, uh, in addition to Dunkin' Donuts. We are still waiting for Three Daughters Brewery to come online, but again, uh, the increase in uh, concession revenue continues to grow, so that is very encouraging. Uh, that was a commitment from the concessionaire to invest $4 million into the terminal to go ahead and improve those restaurants. So again, we're excited to bring that on board and looking forward to the remaining shops, hopefully uh, coming on board in 2021. With our capital improvement program, we certainly put a halt to everything and evaluated it uh, to see what really the impacts were happening uh, coming through March and April. Uh, we felt confident that uh, we could go ahead and reintroduce um, a lot of those. And some of these we're gonna hit on right now. This is an important project. It's a automated inline baggage system, uh, massive in comparison to the one that we had before. Allegiant was operating out of what we refer to as ticketing B. We have two ticketing areas. 
uh, that ticketing B was accommodated with an inline baggage system to help expedite the processing of checked baggage. Well, we need to go ahead and relocate Allegiant into ticketing A. It had double the size of uh, ticket counters, uh, 12 to 21, a little less than double. And in order to do that, we had to build this new automated check baggage system. So it was a $12 million project that uh, we completed. Uh, we were able to go ahead, uh, relocate Allegiant down there, providing them the opportunity to, heat, uh, to meet current demand and also future growth. Uh, even with the impacts of COVID, uh, the need for that space uh, still exists. So we're glad to see that on board. Talked about the increased uh, baggage throughput. As you can see there, significant from 250 bags an hour to as many as 1,300 bags. Uh, we also built it uh, to be able to accommodate a future, if you will, um, an X-ray machine to meet uh, future bag demand. Another big accomplishment was the uh, renovation and expansion of gates seven through 11. Uh, there was our second hold room, uh, significant expansion, um, increased seating, uh, more charging stations than you can think of. Uh, we also had a, a nursing room, uh, beautiful family restrooms, uh, new uh, kids play area that was actually sponsored by a Great Explorations Children's Museum. Uh, certainly a more open experience than we had before, a tropical feel. Uh, and um, we've received, uh, needless to say, just great compliments on that. So we were glad to go ahead and have that open. There was about $11 million project that was completed last year. With our uh, U.S. Customs facility that's been in place since the 80s, uh, we recently invested $8 million to go ahead and renovate the facility. And we, we had a need to do that. Uh, U.S. Customs comes out with different design standards. And at the time, we were sort of behind the times. So, we invested this money because we knew there were new opportunities on the horizon for new international service. Um, certainly we've talked to carriers, but in particular, Allegiant publicly announced that they were ready to go and look at international flights, predominantly into the Caribbean, into Mexico, starting in 2021. And uh, we were gonna be at least, if not the first, the second to city to see that inter international service. Of course, that's been put on hold, hold but nonetheless, we're still in a position to be able to accommodate um, uh, international passengers at a, at a greater level than we saw before, being able to process as many as uh, 300 passengers per hour. Uh, we also included the additional of what's uh, now commonplace, the, uh, the kiosks and the global entry machines. And one that's a very painful project, at least for us and probably the, the community, uh, because of the disruption, not only with the parking at the airport, but with the ongoing construction with the Gateway Express project, that's an FDOT project. We invested $14 million to go ahead and expand our parking. One of the biggest challenges that we had uh, with Allegiance growth, with seeing uh, four years of double digit growth, is that trying to meet that parking demand. Uh, we've um, we have two economy lots, and we also increased the long-term and short-term parking by 38%. Uh, there was more to this project. We also realigned the whole circulation route, and that was a necessity because the whole entryway into the airport uh, was impacted uh, with the Gateway project. It actually had to re be relocated to the south. So that project was uh, completed earlier this year, and uh, again, we're now in a better uh, position to accommodate parking. Certainly, the parking demand is down, but uh, we anticipate that to go up. I, I will share with you, I've, uh, you may have heard me talk in years past that we were looking, that we were thought we were gonna be in a position as far as the next phase of parking to go vertical with a parking garage. Um, we're not sure if that's the direction we're going. We're actually gonna be doing a study this year to determine are there other ways to increase parking without going vertical. It's a minimum cost, about a $20 million project, so if there's other opportunities to maybe look at using that money uh, elsewhere, investing that into the terminal, we're gonna take a look at that. So we'll be able to report a little better on that um, later this year. We're very glad to see uh, Allegiant make their own investment into the airport. They spent uh, just a little under $5 million in building a new um, uh, maintenance and operations facility. They were currently uh, operating out of uh, buildings that they were leasing from the airport. Uh, again, they wanted to make their own investment and provide the opportunity for uh, greater space to, to meet their growth, um, uh, potential growth. So again, that was brought online uh, just last year. 
Again, we were very concerned when COVID hit. This project was about 90% complete. Everything was put on hold. They understood that um, you know, they were still gonna grow uh, at Pi and they wanted to continue with that investment. So they went ahead and, and completed that project uh, in July of, of last year. So again, our capital improvement program continues to, to be robust in order to, to meet that growth. Uh, we're seeing it come back, as Jeff said, it's coming back at a faster rate, certainly not what we wanna see, but uh, we're currently sitting at passenger levels that we saw around 2015, so hopefully we'll, we'll bring those back uh, sooner within the next uh, couple of years. And with that said, I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to present and certainly um, have time for questions. Tom, thank you. I always like hearing uh, from our airport and so much going on out there. And uh, I'm glad that that parking lot project is over. What a nightmare. Uh, I'm sure you all lived it every single day, but, uh, yeah. but anyway. Yeah, it was certainly the challenge again, trying to do what we could to at least keep that passenger experience up. But even anytime you're going through the construction, it's, uh, it's certainly a challenge. And the runways are all back and runways are all done and Operate. Yeah, one of the uh, uh, big projects that we have going on this year is we're doing a uh, pavement rehabilitation to our primary runway, uh, the north-south runway, longest one, just under 10,000 feet. Uh, that project started last year, and uh, we are uh, nearing completion. That will be done at the end of February. There was a point in time where we had to uh, shut down that runway for about four months and transition all the traffic farther to the uh, east, which was an impact to uh, the communities. but. Uh, those closures are done, so yes, we're nearing the end. That's great, good. Uh, any questions for Tom? Yeah, Mayor. First, I know it looks weird that I'm standing. I had back surgery four weeks ago. It can only sit for 15 minutes at a time, so <laughs> I apologize. Tom, how much of the projects that uh, you were showing us were bonded, and with the revenue decreases, are you covering? Mm -hmm. all the bond exposure right now? Well, I'm glad to announce that we have no debt. We have no bonds. Uh, everything is pay as you go. Uh, we have very healthy reserves to cover us for about two and a half years. So we are well positioned to weather the storm. And uh, that was really the first internal messaging that I did with the, uh, COVID to let the employees know that jobs are protected, we're, we can weather the storm. So yes, we're well positioned to get through this without uh, any debt any bond debt specifically. Yeah, Tony. Morning, Tom. Thank you, Tony. Um, is Allegiant telling you that there's higher demand in certain areas versus others? For example, is it the Southeast? Is it the Midwest? Is it the Northeast? Are you getting any kind of feedback from Allegiant on that? Uh, we're definitely getting feedback, but it's not just Allegiant, it's almost the industry. The focus right now is the whole Florida destination. That's where people are finding the most comfort to come back to. Uh, in particular, those um, uh, areas along the coast, along the Gulf, the beach communities. Uh, there's still, you know, apprehension as far as putting more destinations into the central Florida market because that is slower to come back. Um, but at the same time, I mean, all the airlines, while, yeah, probably more of the focus is more of the Florida destinations, they're looking at every, everything on the map. They're looking at trying to plug holes and utilize uh, aircraft when they can, at least until such time that you know, not, not just the, all of the uh, uh, leisure traveler, but also the business traveler comes back that they're having a lot of struggles with. But is there certain areas that they're coming, you know, the point of origin is, are we seeing an uptick in the Midwest? Are we, you, you know? Want to talk that? I don't know if you know specifics other than the general <coughs> areas that we've talked about. There's really no specifics on that, Tony. I mean, it's been a challenge because certain states obviously have different restrictions and sure. closures. I mean, we have a lot of, destinations located inside New York State. And New York State, with all of their closures and restrictions on travel, has really been a big impact. In fact, one of the things I didn't say was the only city that we lost service throughout the entire pandemic was to Ogdensburg, New York. And so for those of you who know where Ogdensburg's located, it's right across the border, literally right over the river from Ottawa. And being that Canadians, again, couldn't go across the border, it just was inevitable that they had to close down that certain city. But as Tom said, they're really looking at all areas, but again, have to follow very closely what states have restrictions in place and closures, and then work around that, add capacity to one, decrease capacity from another. 
But uh, I can't tell you that there's any one particular one that's coming back faster than the others. That so, would be information that would be valuable if Allegiant was willing to share to share with us. Sure. And, and again, there is a lag, as you know, in data. And so sure. I will know that data once it's available to us right now. It's only available up and through September. And I don't know that that really gives us an accurate wow. picture. But once full year of 2020 data is available to me, then I can share some of that with you. That'd be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yes, Mike. Tom, let me ask a question, and I'm going to show my ignorance here. Is there an opportunity or are there, are there strategies in place to be talking with other airlines in bringing flights into PIE? Yeah, no, absolutely. And those uh, conversations are actually taking place right now, and those uh, conversations <coughs> have been taking place for a while. Um, there are, and some of you may know, there are a couple uh, new uh, uh, entrant airlines are looking at coming into the market, um, and there's been a, in different publications that they have been having focus release. Uh, people have been thinking that they're looking at the St. Pete Clearwater Airport. So yes, those conversations are are always continuing. Uh, yes, you, you hear a lot about Allegiant, um, but understand that that we're not sitting comfortable knowing that we have them. We're always looking to try to bring in new markets, uh, new airlines into the into our destination. Right. Good. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, guys. Really Great. appreciate your being here this morning. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, yeah continue. Good, good luck. luck out there. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Tom and Jeff. Thank you for that um, up that update. It's always great and excited to, to see what's happening out, out at Pi. Um, our next presentation is from Creative Pinellas, um, and I've been really excited to get to know Barbara and her team this past year. I know Tony sits on the board uh, for Creative Pinellas, uh, so we've got, you know, as a TDC, a, a, you know, uh, some insight to what's going on, but I think this the update we get from them is uh, critically important, and I'm excited to hear all the wonderful things that are happening with Creative Pinellas. So, Barbara? Good, good morning, and I'm very excited to be telling you all the wonderful things that are happening at Creative Pinellas and in Pinellas County for arts and cultural tourism. I'm Barbara St. Clair. Um, happy to be here. and. I, I have a pretty big presentation with lots of words, but I promise you that most of the words I won't say, they're there so that you can look at them at your leisure, and we have some really good show and tell. Um, so first I wanted to start a little bit with, for those of you who don't know us very well, who we are. We are the local arts agency for Pinellas County. That means we are a partner with um, the Board of County Commissioners, um, Chairman Eggers, good to see you, and welcome to your chairmanship. Um, and we work very hard to enhance Pinellas County as an arts and cultural destination and to build awareness of Pinellas County as an arts and cultural destination. We are located in this same park that you're in right now um, in uh, the gallery. It used to be the Gulf Coast Museum of Art. We are inhabiting that gallery and programming it on a regular basis, which we've done since 2018. And we have transformed it into a vibrant arts destination, drawing visitors and residents alike. Our key objective as an organization is to showcase Pinellas County as an arts and cultural destination, to promote economic development and build capacity. And our mission is to foster and sustain a vibrant, inclusive, and collaborative arts community and across Pinellas County in order to grow and sustain the area as an internationally recognized arts and cultural destination. So um, let me come through to, uh, oh, before I do that, we are also the proud recipient of Creative Loafing 2020 Best of the Bay for being a virtual arts trailblazer. And that was from the Critics' Choice they recognized us as leading the way during once COVID hit to transitioning the arts from in-person to online. And uh, so they voted us the best of the Bay, which we were very happy to receive. So what do we do? Um, we do a number of things. We have grants for artists, and some of those grants are for emerging young artists, and those are capacity building grants to build a pipeline of artists to keep this community very vibrant. We also have professional artist grants. They're sustained support and grow 
our artists. What we're actually finding now is that artists are moving to Pinellas County. I've spoken to three or four of them recently. And part of the reason they're moving here is because of the kind of support they get when they move here. And I kind of want to remind everybody that artists are really manufacturers. And the creation of art is an export business. So um, bringing artists here to Pinellas County is improving the economic well-being of Pinellas County. Um, we manage the gallery, as I said, and I want to point out that we have a show that's open right now. You'll hear a little bit more about it in a minute. It's called the Arts Annual. It is open right now. The gallery is open Wednesday through Sunday from noon to 5. I would encourage you, since we're in, it's just down across the bridge in the park and through the Botanical Gardens, if you have five minutes before you get in your car and head back to work, to stop and visit the gallery and see the show. We have festivals, workshops, and artist talks. A recent workshop we did, we did a live glass blowing workshop in partnership with Duncan McClellan Gallery. We brought in Rob Stearns, and people actually were able to make souvenir etched glass products that they brought home. It was really exciting. We have programs for accessibility. So for example, we had a big show in the gallery where every piece, every object, art object, was meant to be touched. It was designed for the visually impaired so that they could come in and experience art the way a visually abled person would, but um, all, through their, all through the ability to touch. We also have programs in the community, a really wonderful program that we're very proud of called the Arts Catalyst Grant that sends kids to summer camp for high quality arts experiences. So if you go to a Title I school or you're in the school lunch program, or you're in the criminal justice system or in the foster care program, we will invite the, the child or the family to pick out the arts camp they want to go to, and we'll send them to a session. Um, in our first year, 69% of the kids who attended that program had never been to day camp ever before. Um, and 85% of them had never had a high quality arts experience. So we're really proud of that program. And I will also share with you in a minute how that morphed over the COVID summer. We support public art, and for example, we have the Spacecraft Project, which invites adults and children to come for high quality arts experiences, and it travels around the country. It was in Oldsmar. Right now, it's in Palm Harbor and Seminole, and will be headed throughout the county over the next 18 months. Um, because of the particular times we're in, Creative Pinellas stretched a little bit this past year, and we partnered with um, the Foundation for a Healthy St. Pete, the Pinellas Community Foundation, and the St. Pete Arts Alliance. We raised $137,000 from private community and uh, foundations and distributed $137,000 to professional artists, arts organizations, and creative businesses. And you can see by those charts that we hit throughout the county. And I want to mention that the money went out in two waves. The first wave went out at the end of April. So if you all recall, we closed down Mar middle of March. We pulled this together and had money out into the community in less than two months. We also worked with Pinellas County on the Pinellas Cares micro grants. We helped them with outreach to artists and with vetting the arts applications from artists and marketing to the community. And we also partnered with Visit St. Pete Clearwater on a program to help arts nonprofits. Um, and then I mentioned our Arts Catalyst program. We morphed that into directly working with arts nonprofits who then brought arts programming to um, daycare uh, facilities that were serving essential workers. And we served 1,200 young people. We provided arts educational programs to 1,200 young people over the summer of COVID. Um, I want to talk now more specifically about key tourism projects. Um, one of the ones that we're most proud of is the Arts Annual. We started it in 2019, so this is our third year. Um, we ran it as a safe, socially distanced live show in the gallery, a lifelike online gallery exhibition, which you'll see a little bit of shortly, a virtual arts festival featuring literary, performing, and visual artists, and then a partnership with area hotels to display works of art that was featured by the Arts Annual painters and sculptors, and then a video marketing campaign promoting participating hotels and artists. 
Um, and by offering the Arts Annual through multiple channels, we were able to market our arts and cultural destination throughout the world, certainly across the country, and we have data that supports that. And we very specifically chose to have the Arts Annual in November because we recognize it as a cultural, as a, a shoulder month. And therefore, if we could move the needle a little bit in November, and we believe we can over time, um, it will become a destination calendared event. Um, we also expanded our Arts Annual Beyond the Walls. We did it last year. It was very successful. It's designed to connect tourists and tourism industry to the arts, brings unique arts experiences directly to hotel guests. This year, we added a video element and produced individual storytelling videos for each hotel that highlight both the featured artist and the property. And we placed a small media buy. We did not spend a lot of money because it was a pilot program, but we spent enough to make sure that we would get results in key travel markets, including Atlanta, Jacksonville, Fort Myers, Miami, and Orlando, to build awareness um, for the people making travel plans about what they might actually experience when they came to Pinellas County. And I'm going to invite Lee Davis, our arts and cultural manager, to come over and talk to you a little bit and uh, give you a little bit of a live experience of what uh, the Arts Annual Beyond the Walls was like this year. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, we're thrilled to be able to create a program that brings unique experiences to our hotel guests and provides positive messaging with potential visitors. We had 12 different hotel partners from all over the county this year, some returning and some new, including the Alden Suites, the Birchwood, Innisbrook Golf and Spa Resort, and the Sheraton Sand Key Resort and 12 different artists with sculpture, paintings, and pottery participating in the program. And we wanna thank everyone on the TDC that participated with us this year. So let me give you an example of what people in cities like Atlanta, Orlando, Miami saw in their Facebook feed. This features the collaborative team of Make It Stackhouse Studios, which are the 2020 Creative Pinellas Artist Laureate and the Sheraton Sand Key Resort, and it reached 14,434 people. Seeing art in an art space is very confining. It's sort of it's sort of the sign saying "see art here," you know, and you are looking at art. And if you don't really think you know anything about art, you uh, you you sort of shy away from it. The thing about about art is, as as we we sort of mentioned before, is it's all connected and it's all sort of things. There's no there's no book on really how to look at art, and because we all look at it individually. But I think the thing about seeing it outside of that venue, seeing it in the real world, it's become part of the world. It, it, it's not separated by a gallery wall saying, see art here. Robert and I are a, an art team, and we work together. And we work together on almost everything we do. We do paintings, large-scale paintings, small-scale paintings. We do prints. We do big um, installations, permanent installations, sometimes temporary ones. And I think what we've learned from working a lot throughout the country and with developers and things is that they realize that art increases the value of their whatever they're developing. And I think hotels like the Sand Key is understanding that having art, especially from people who live in the area, that they can offer their clientele um, a very unique experience. Here at the resort, we're very excited to partner with Creative Pinellas on this new project. Um, so often Pinellas County is thought about as the beach is on one side and arts and culture over in St. Pete. And it's exciting to bring the arts and culture over here to the beaches. 
So these artists, Carol Mickett and Robert Stackhouse, have been collaborating for over 10 years. Um, I think that their cultural background with the arts and theater and film is really well-rounded and something we can relate to um, and enjoy having here in the hotel that our guests will relate to as well. The arts create it from a deep place in you. Because why, if you're gonna spend your time doing something, it's usually something that you're passionate about. My name's Carol Mickett. And my name is Robert Stackhouse. We have Mickett Stackhouse Studio in Tarpon Springs. So these videos were a foundation of a multi-platform social media and email marketing campaign. On Facebook, they had a total reach of over 145,000 viewers with an average of 12,500 viewers per hotel partner. In addition to Instagram, Twitter, and email marketing, there was a fantastic article about the arts annual BTW program in the Creative Loafing. Creative Pinellas built a mini Arts Annual Beyond the Walls site for each hotel partner with links back to their website that featured a shopping platform so visitors could purchase touch free and have their art shipped directly to them. Over the past three years, Arts Annual has grown as a regional destination event for arts lovers. More than 25% of Arts Annual attendees are coming from outside of Pinellas County. And in 2020, Creative Pinellas sold over $15,000 in art to regional and to national co collectors. People travel to experience arts and culture. One of the key elements that leveraged Art Basel into the expansiveness of Miami Art Week was the multiple collaborations with hotels to host art exhibits and special events. And with continued partnership with Visit St. Pete Clearwater, Arts Annual can keep in alignment with international events like Arts Basel Miami to bring vis visitors to the region in fourth quarter. So I'd like to thank you all for your support of Creative Pinellas. Thank you, Lee. And I want to share a theory that we had going into this. Um, we knew that people were more hesitant to travel and needed good reasons to feel confident about where they were going. And there's one, you know, one way of approaching people, and you can say things like, um, we've changed our cleaning processes, so we're increasing sanitation, or, you know, we have... Um, a mask policy and, and we put you first and we care about you and so we're doing everything to make you safe and comfortable. And that's a very direct message and it's important to have a direct message. But you can also have an indirect message that says, see how much we care about you as a guest, that we are going to bring art and we are going to take our time to make sure that your experiences when you come to our hotel are really stellar. And it's a subtle, approach and it's an emotional approach but we believe if you see a video like that about a hotel you're going to already have a feeling that when you come to that hotel you're going to be well taken care of and that that hotel is committed to excellence and customer service so that was a we're going to be doing that again next year and expanding the program and anybody who's interested is welcome at this point to participate i want to talk now about um Another project that we've been working on very hard over the past eight to ten months, and it's an, we, we have named it the Arts Navigator. And I would like for a minute, if you would imagine with me, an easy to use tool that can help visitors explore and plan a customized arts and cultural experience that both takes advantage of all that Pinellas County has to offer in terms of arts and culture, but also understands that individual well enough to make good recommendations to them that behaves almost like a concierge and so recognizes what type of traveler they are and what their interests are and then directs them to the best possible choices for them. So I'm going to ask Kimberly DeVito who is our Associate Director of Strategic Development to come up and talk to you about how we are bringing that project
Thank you. Good morning. It is such an honor to be back with you here at the TDC. I know last year we came by and started to introduce to you Arts Navigator. So this year, I'm happy to say that we've gone into development and we actually partnered with the Source Toad, who is a software development company who specializes in creating innovative technology for the hospitality industry. Um, Source Toad has proven success in designing and building data-driven back-end systems and front-end interfaces for the tourism industry, specializing in cruise line technology. This is an example of an app that they created to guide cruise uh, line guests uh, through an art gallery actually on a ship. And so this, uh, we felt that they would make a really good partner because they really understood how to engage with the visitor. They're also located in Tampa Bay, which is, brings that personal familiarity with Pinellas County as an arts and culture mecca, and also as a phenomenal tourist destination. <clears throat> the team is super excited to be creating software that their family and friends will actually be able to engage in. So what I'm about to show you is a video that walks us through the back end of Arts Navigator. It's not something that uh, people like you or I will eventually deal with or look at, but something that like an admin would use. So basically you can, we've built the playground to log in, assign roles, um, be able to uh, see what's going on in the back end system. Really it's the structure, the infrastructure of the Arts Navigator. We created a space to build the discovery that um, Barbara was speaking about, um, to get to know our visitors, to that quiz experience. Um, we've established an understanding of what the data that we need to use uh, to, to guide them through that process as far as the categories of asking questions, including the mood, who is traveling with you, the type of art that they currently enjoy, and now we have the system to create that experience. <clears throat> Now the ultimate goal of the Arts Navigator was to understand the events that are in our community. And what you're seeing here is a listing that no one touched, entered. It literally is drawing from what people are posting out online. And so that was the nature of Arts Navigator, um, to be really able to create that without having an impact um, into uh, the organizations <clears throat> in our community. So one of the um, notice here, we're at, uh, we're not quite there yet, <laughs> but one of the uh, events you'll notice is uh, nature journaling, which is from the Dali Museum. And what was really cool and interesting about that is that it actually um, brought users to, we could make that connection with uh, Keep St. Pete Lit. I think it's gonna go right now, <laughs> the nature of video. Here we go, okay. So the, the uh, Arts Navigator is gathering up this information. It got the event description, it's connecting it. We can now make a connection to keep St. Pete Lint on the front end system once that we build that out. And we, we make, basically we proved our uh, proof of concept that we can do it. We can get to the data, we can present it to the end user. And so now, since we've done that work, We've uh, started on creating the look and feel. And so we've established the uh, brand identity and promise. Um, we utilized uh, and partnered with Roundhouse Creative Studio. We've uh, developed the Arts Navigator logo and mark that you see here. And we're, we've created a voice for the customer interface, which is that concierge who's a great listener who learns about you first and makes recommendations based on who you are and how you feel at that time. That's why we were really impressed to kind of work through the process of understanding people's moods because we all change from day to day. So we're well on our way to bringing the Pinellas County Arts Navigator to life and can't wait to show you more. Thank you, Kimberly. And so Kimberly was showing you a video um, of the back end that actually is built. She was showing you the video because we can't tap into the back end here in, in this meeting service, but that all exists. And um, just want to reiterate that the 900 bits of data, the 900 events and activities that were listed in there, not one of them was entered by hand. The uh, data management tool that we have built it's gone out to different sites on the internet, pulled them down in terms of the date, the time, the location, the content, 
and is getting pretty much everything that we wanted it to get. So that, um, we have learned over time that that was a huge, a huge uh, milestone to cross and a really strong innovation. And we did focus primarily on that back end because we felt that if we could not answer that question, we did not want to invest any further. But we have answered that question. So our next step is the really fun, high-end, good-looking uh, user interface. I also wanted to share with you um, our other innovation, um, which is our virtual art gallery. We were working on this last year as a sales tool to expand the reach of our artists. We happened to have it ready when COVID hit. And so we did a very quick pivot and started putting our gallery shows online. The nice thing about this gallery is it gives you a feeling of being there. It's got a life-like sense of scale and light. I'm gonna invite Danny Alda from the team to walk you through it. So we have done four shows using this tool and have had tremendous enthusiasm from the arts community. And I think once Danny shows this to you, you'll see why. Yeah. So I'll just give you a quick tour of one of our virtual galleries here. Like Barbara mentioned, we have the arts annual up right now in the physical gallery just along the way. We also have it virtually. And this is a video of two virtual galleries that we have open right now. So the, probably the first thing you notice is the accessibility. It's been great to have during the pandemic when people might be a little reticent to come to the physical gallery. But really, we notice the accessibility. It opens these artists and uh, this artwork to a much wider audience beyond the Bay Area, beyond the state, and even the country. It gets people from outside the area into a Pinellas County gallery pretty easily. It's also very cool. It's fun to use. Right in this video, I'm using the keyboard to navigate my way through a gallery as I see fit, as I want to. You can use your mouse to do it. It feels a lot like a video game. But it's actually really practical, too. A lot of this artwork is all uh, to scale, which is very important in understanding what a piece of art looks like. You can see sort of these shadow people to give you a reference for how big the artwork is. You can also imagine it pretty easily in your own home or office. And it also makes the artwork very easy to purchase. If you click on a work of art, it'll actually take you directly to that piece, is what I do here. Some artwork by an artist named Shan Lee. And you click in the top right corner, you can get all the information you want to know, like the artist's name, the media, the price. And you see in the bottom right-hand corner of that box is a buy button where you can easily purchase a work of art through an online shop that we have set up. Or you can invite friends to see this work of art. It'll send people a link that will not only bring them to the virtual gallery, but to stand virtually right here in front of this particular piece. Uh, so you can show off a work of art that you want to see. Additionally, uh, you can learn more about pieces of art by adding additional media to the artwork itself, like uh, sound files or videos. For example, we'll take a look at this triptych by Elizabeth Baroness. And when you click on the media button there, it'll bring you to additional media. In this case, we have a studio visit with the artist where she shows us around her studio, how she creates her work. Hey, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Baroness, and I'm an artist in St. Pete. I would like... So this virtual gallery has been a great tool, of course, during the pandemic for live stream events. We've hosted uh, virtual tours of the gallery. We've had interactive events with uh, live streams on Facebook where audience members on Facebook have been able to ask questions in real time of the artists, and we can share it and walk through the gallery, uh, coffees with the cur cur uh, coffee with the curator events. And in the future, we plan on using this much more uh, to have exhibitions that reflect uh, in-person exhibitions or virtual uh, online exclusive type exhibitions, but really opening to much more artists and broadening their audience in Pinellas County uh, as an arts and cultural destination. Thank you, Danny. So I'm just going to quickly wrap up with the sort of more standardized things we do. Um, during COVID, we launched an Arts In Portal, which right now has 175 videos. We launched it in April, and it features um, visual and music and drama and dance of artists in Pinellas County. We have our Arts Coast Journal, which we have expanded um, to also include how to enjoy the arts online. We have our Arts and Cultural Guide, which has every arts and cultural organization and in Pinellas County and what they do. It's available at visitor centers, chambers, hotels. We've given out boxes and boxes at, at, at um, Pi. 
Um, and uh, we are starting an Arts Coast training experience that Lee, who you met a few minutes ago, will be managing. She's designed it to be very user friendly for hotels and restaurants that want their teams to know what's going on in the arts in Pinellas County. We are launching an online version this spring. And in terms of 2021 initiatives, we are very excited to be working on the strategic plan with Visit St. Pete Clearwater and also on partnering with Visit St. Pete Clearwater and arts and culture institutions to develop messaging and strategies for marketing programs to promote arts and culture locally and out of market. We're also going to be working more closely with area chambers to develop and share programs, identify and establish programs with new key partners, and update the Creative Pinellas brand and website, all 2020 initiatives. And uh, we will be back here in six months to tell you how all of that is going. Thank you so very much for your attention this uh, morning. And please let me know if there are any questions that I might be able to answer for you. Barbara, first of all, thank you. Um, that was great update as to what you are doing now. And that's awesome and some of the plans ahead. So thank you for being here this morning. Any, any quick questions? Yes, Tony. fact that I didn't have my microphone on again. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, the fact that um, we are going to be at the cutting edge of this and, and one of the things that Barbara touched on is that the problem with these sites is somebody has to update them and inevitably they're not updated. Um, with the way this system is set up where it's reaching out, gathering the information and bringing it back, this is going to be fresh. This is going to be like it's live. So. Um, I, I, I am your cheerleader, <laughs> yes, Barbara. Yeah. Great, great job, you and your team, what you do, and uh, and good luck moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for those comments. I agree with you. I, I'm a big cheerleader for for Bar uh, for your team, you and your team. It's just it's a great, great, great work team. that they do. Anybody else? Yes. Oh, excuse me. Um, I'd like to say thank you, Barbara. It's uh, your leadership and your team, uh, the small team that you have. Uh, that has really made this partnership, as Tony and I know, that um, there wasn't that many years ago that we would have meetings and it was the enemy and, and, and the funder and, and everything, and you came in and really made this partnership. And I think this navigator is just unbelievable. I think also that, yes, you did show Sheridan San Key, but that program you have in hotels, it also brings the employees into it also and uh it's been good for everybody and uh, uh i think things have changed and 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 we're going to hear from tom james next but i think he's been, he was in a couple of those meetings that uh he was looking for uh help for the arts uh not for the uh for uh, uh just one area of the county but um, and uh, you've really pulled it together and the uh, industry works with you and admires what you do, and I thank you. Well, thank you, thank you. I'm like not walking on this, the floor anymore. I'm like six <laughs> inches above it at this moment, yeah. so. Well, uh, great work, Barbara. Again, thank you for your time. Look forward to more good things this year and see you in six months. All right. I'm sure thank we'll see you, you sooner, but you. take care, Barbara. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, the next presentation, and this is gonna, this is gonna dovetail on what uh, both Russ and Tony said. Um, in the importance of arts to a community and beyond what Creative Pinellas is doing. And so I had a meeting 
it was probably about two or three months ago with uh, Laura Hine, and she included Mr. James in this meeting and was so inspired about the thinking and, and direction. I said, you know, why don't use this as an opportunity to come to the Tourist Development Council and talk briefly on the, the arts and vision and going forward. So I'd like to introduce uh, Tom James, the founder and chairman uh, of the James Museum and of Western and Wildlife Art and Laura Hine, the executive director. Welcome. Uh, members, I've been before this group before. <laughs> Uh, it may be different uh, members, but I came to make the pitch to get the TDC to support us for the Dali Museum when I was chairman of the Dali Museum. And I just want to report uh, that that worked out very well. I came a second time to tell you that uh, room taxes increased. Uh, not in the or paid back the investment uh, in three years, uh, they paid it back in two years. And I can tell you, as I made that pitch the first time, uh, it's the gift that keeps giving, uh, keeps on giving. And it's a uh, uh, we really appreciate that. And just to give you an update, since uh, Steve knows and some of the mayors clearly know. Uh, we uh, celebrated the 10th anniversary of the Dali Museum. I'm still a, a member and a board member of the Dali. And we have a show for Van Gogh, uh, currently using the most modern art projection techniques uh, that are really state of the art. And we're sold out in advance, uh, 900 visitors a day. And I guarantee you, if we didn't have this uh, pandemic with us, we'd, we'd have 3,000 a day, uh, which is about the, but you can't do that and handle it safely and comfortably. And, and of course, we're all committed to the idea that uh, we had to continue to deliver uh, at the James Museum. Uh, some of you may not be as familiar with that. Uh, my wife and I uh, decided to build a house for our best, the best art in our collection, and uh, put it in downtown St. Petersburg uh, to complement the Dali, the Museum of Fine Arts, the Shahuli, the Imagine, the, soon the Arts and Crafts, uh, all of these museums that indeed follow right on what Barbara's been trying to do, makes St. Petersburg and Tampa Bay in general a real art destination and a great place to come to, whether you like to go to the beach, play golf, play tennis, whatever it is, or do everything when you're there and stay a little longer. So uh, Mary and I did it mainly with that vision uh, at the forefront of why we did that. We have no economic gain from this, and we donated $75 million to build that museum downtown. So you should know that we're, uh, we're very committed. Uh, and uh, Steve's been helpful for us, and you were helpful for us early, and proved that making an investment uh, works. I'm not here asking for an investment in dollars <laughs> for a building or an art collection. Uh, I donated all that. I'm here to ask for your support to help us build the reputation, which is part of your mission anyway. So I'm not asking you to extend, except to make sure that you take advantage of everything we offer. Uh, we have such great natural buttes, uh, attributes. We have great hotels and motels. We've got great sports. Uh, this place has transmogrified itself over my lifetime here. I came here 75 years ago and uh, when I was three, and uh, not by choice. Uh, but the, uh, uh, I can tell you, if anybody had told me when I left to go away to college uh, that St. Petersburg and downtown St. Petersburg were not in a state of uh, protective care, uh, it, it's unbelievable what's happened here. This is one of the greatest places to come. 
uh, in the whole country. And uh, I just want to uh, tell you that it's my pleasure to have done what I've done. I'm sorry we had this timing uh, issue come up, uh, but I can tell you that we have done, uh, we have a very high quality staff. We were closed for a couple months. We reopened. Uh, we have a sm slightly smaller staff than we had originally, but it's still a, a major museum type staff. The museum is actually uh, a lot larger than the Dali, uh, so that we display about 400 pieces of art and sculpture there. You really can't go through there in one visit. And when we have guest shows, we also can give large visiting shows of all types. This is not limited. We're trying to both uh, feature Florida's local artists, uh, it's young artists, but also artists from all over the world and all types of art. So it's, in, in a sense, we do more than Western and wildlife art. So that's, that's our objective. But I think you would find we have one of the best collections in the country uh, in a Western museum. There are 12 or 13 large Western museums in the United States, and we're one of the best. So uh, it's, I think it's a great place to visit, and I think we need to tell the world. And so uh, when I talked to Steve, uh, I asked, uh, you know, we need to advertise this. It's helped the Dali immensely. I can't tell you. You featured the Dali a lot in the advertising. And uh, the Dali has really benefited and still the leader in the movement. You can't find many Dalis in the world, even when they're not with us any longer, that you can show. And to have a collection like that here in Tampa Bay is beyond comprehension. Uh, it, it's better than Figueroa, Spain. So. Uh, we we all benefit from that, creates a little tailwind for the other museums. But I still think we're not benefiting as much as we can from it. So all I'm here for is to thank you for what you've done so far and to uh, ask you to continue doing it. Uh, what's Bar what Barbara's doing is great for the local artists, but we display the best artists in the world in wildlife and the best art artist in North America uh, in uh, Western and uh, art. So uh, that means a lot of Native American art. There's a lot of interest now in thinking about our beginnings. And we tell both sides of that story because indeed there are two sides to that story. It isn't all fantasy movies. Uh, it was a lot of hard work out West, but it was also uh, pretty uh, ugly with respect to the Native American population that was here when, when uh, uh, most of our ancestors came to, to uh, the United States, uh, what became the United States. So I'm going to ask uh, Laura to come up here uh, and uh, give you a few facts. Some of you know Laura Hine. Uh, She's actually the wife of the executive director of the Dali Museum and was my point person for construction uh, and recently elected to the uh, school board here. Uh, and I can tell you uh, she's becoming a great executive director of a museum. Laura. Thank you, Tom. Good morning. Thank you for having us here this morning. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be talking with you. I just thought I would mention a couple of things around the potential market of the arts and culture visitor and how I really believe our county can leverage that to have a very positive impact on economic development. And as you're entering this strategic planning process is a, is a, is a great time to be talking about this as you consider how you can most optimize these public resources that your, that your group um, handles for us. So um, as you enter this process, I would just mention two things. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the Blue Ocean Strategy. It was published by Harvard Business Review in the early 2000s. I, I, I thought that that was a, a, a foundational study. And what it, what, it, what it talks about is identifying 
unchartered competitive advantages. So it's one thing to be operating and competing within a red ocean where everyone's competing for the same tourist, right? For the same person who's, who's, who's looking for a place to just go to arts and culture or to just go to the beach or to just golf or to just do these things. But in, in you're competing there. But what if there was a new market? What if there was a market, a blue ocean, where there, where there wasn't all already this competition. And just one of the things that I wonder is if there is a new untapped market for us, for here, for Pinellas County, that does include that arts and culture tourist that we haven't tapped yet, that is also then together with the, with the beach tourists and restaurants and so on. So it, again, it's this new untapped market, potentially. Certainly keep the current market coming strong and then add this additional untapped market. The second thing that I just wanted to share with you is really anecdotal. So I've been around the arts and culture uh, scene for quite some time, as Tom, as Tom mentioned. So I talk with lots of different visitors. We also have fellow museum directors from other parts of the country visit us. We just had coffee the other day with the director of the Indianapolis Museum of Art. It was his first time visiting the area. And he just said, wow, I had no idea. I had no idea you had so many resources, arts and culture resources here. And there are so many visitors, not, not just museum directors, regular visitors who, who, who say that to us. I had, I had no idea you had these multiple museums, orchestra, opera, um, galleries, all the various pieces. I would have stayed longer. I would have stayed a few more days. I would have extended my stay. And so I guess the hypothesis that we're suggesting today is that really looking at the arts and culture market could possibly to do two things. One could be this new untapped market, plus extended stays with our current market. And just that would equal even further economic development and uh, thriving Pinellas County. So I, I would just like to encourage you to examine this hypothesis during your planning, perhaps, this year. Um, and I also want to offer our staff um, at the museum, if there's anything that we can do to help. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I just wanted to offer that. We're happy to collaborate. Um, it isn't just about the James Museum. It hasn't been, as, 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 as Tom shared with you. Of course, we are doing our best for a thriving organization. And that's each museum's responsibility and each arts organization's responsibility, right? But there's the bigger funnel. There's the bigger work of getting the visitor here, of getting the tourists here, and then, and, and then we can all do our magic. We can all give the very best that we can for that um, experience. And then I also just wanted to say, um, if you haven't visited our museum, I welcome you. I would love to welcome you. I would, I would love to receive you. So certainly contact us and let me know. And I look forward to that. And thank you for your service um, on this body and otherwise. Thanks, thank thanks for having us. Thank you both. Um, those are absolutely awesome words. Uh, and uh, at the same time, additional challenges for us to uh, incorporate. Uh, does anybody have any question? Yes, uh, Mayor Chrysler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Not really questions, just a couple comments. Um, I think there was a number of things that were said that, that are really pertinent and relevant to, our, uh, to the work that we're all doing. And I don't remember if it was as Tony or Russ that, that said this in their comments earlier, uh, but our arts and culture, our museums uh, are really for purposes of marketing, isn't something we ought to just be talking about as a rainy day activity uh, or something to do if you're trying to figure out, you know, I don't want to go to the beach today, I've gone for the last six days. I think it is a real opportunity uh, for us to market um, both the beaches and arts together. Uh, because a lot of times people who are going to come that want to go to the museums, they're going to want to stay on the beach. That way they get the best of both worlds. Uh, and so I think it's, it is, as, as Laura was talking about, it's, a, it's an untapped market. Um, I look at St. Pete. We've got 11 museums in St. Petersburg. Uh, and I don't know of any other city our size in the country that has the same number of museums. But yet, you know, I don't know how much we're really all doing collectively uh, to market that that uh, that fact, and I think it's a real, again, an untapped uh, opportunity and an untapped market. And then just the last comment I want to make is, uh, and Tom has said this that uh, they built a house for their collection. Well, they they built a grand house. If you have ever been to the James Museum, um, I, I give Jan a lot of credit, uh, the architect on it. Uh, it is one of the best designed museums inside to show off what is truly a remarkable collection. 
Um, and it's just, uh, this is a great time. Take advantage of this pandemic to visit our museums and visit the James Museum because you really get an opportunity to spend, and it's something else we ought to market. You have an opportunity to spend a good deal of time really taking your time going through the museum, which sometimes when they're really, really busy, when we're not in the pandemic, is not as easy to do. So I think that's an opportunity that we have too during this pandemic is to market the fact that you've got an opportunity to really spend quality time in the museum and, and absorb it and take it in. So just want to encourage everybody to do that. And, and thank you for uh, allowing this presentation. I think it was really important. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Anybody else? Okay, thank you so much again for being here this morning. Okay, um, we have a, a couple of folks uh, that will be leaving at uh, 1045 and 11, so uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll direct us to the most critical issue left, uh, and then we'll kind of finish up uh, along the way. Go ahead. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I just might add, um, Laura, thank you for reminding me about uh, the that book. I read that probably about 10, 12 years ago, and it, a great read and looking at strategy and and really where where you could be fishing uh versus where where you are where you are fishing uh on our marketing updates i'm going to have leroy come up and uh, i think one of the first things i want to have him um, hopefully address is messaging around the busy season as we are coming into busy season um you know uh, we had a, a conversation at the, the the county level with folks uh, really talking about um, let's make sure that a we don't we don't embrace or embrace the or grace the cover of the New York Times with crowds, but uh, we have a great positive story about how we're doing things responsibly. So I want to have Leroy talk about some of the things that we are doing or things that we're not doing um, as we head into um, our busy season. Thank you for that, Steve. Uh, good morning. Welcome, Commissioner, uh, to the Tourist Development Council. Yeah. Great to have you Thank here. Thank you. Um, so just wanted to take through really quickly kind of the journey we've been on and, and what our goals and objectives and strategy is as we head into uh, spring season. As you'll recall, we launched Rise to Shine uh, pre-Labor Day to encourage kind of restart the engines of sorts in a positive, proactive, visiting safely and responsibly manner, uh, keeping that close to home uh, with primarily marketing in destination and upstream in our number one market, Orlando. Uh, again, that audience being residents, locals, prospective visitors, and those who, who were here, as well as our industry. Um, coming out of Rise to Shine, we, we have, we did launch, and we, we talked about this uh, back in November and December, our Immerse Your Senses campaign, which was, uh, you know, what we were kind of calling internally our winter recovery campaign. So, uh, again, just to kind of reiterate what that campaign looked like in the markets, I want to emphasize here the audience, you know, in particular who we're going after, ages 35 to 65, uh, you know, household income over 100,000 plus, and they have travel interest in this moment and, and beach interest in particular the challenge is right now as you all know continued in 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 the pandemic is people want to be outside people want a beach uh, destination that that's a positive for us but that segment who's willing to travel amidst the 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 global health crisis is significantly smaller than normal but you can see the markets that we've launched that campaign that campaign is still running in those markets uh, the traditional media listed here is running heavily in state and Indianapolis, Cincinnati. We have digital that's running across the state as well as those key out-of-state markets uh, to drive inspiration and visitation as we roll into 2021 and the spring season, which is where we kind of wanted to focus our attention as of right now. Obviously, spring is a very important time for, for the destination. March is by far our uh, uh, biggest month for visitors, ADR, highest ADR for our hoteliers. And so we, we want to make sure that we're driving business for that time period. But as Steve mentioned, juggling the, 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 the pandemic at the same time, right, is, is walking that balance of inspiration, driving visitors, driving business, driving economic impact, 
but keeping people safe. So just want to touch on, again, our goals strategy as we, as we move forward into February, March, where, where you know, visitation increases. Obviously, we want to encourage visitation. Uh, some, of this, some of the goals that we're working into the strategy and how we're shaping our marketing is promoting our lesser known beaches as well. The challenge can be, as you all know, come March, just about everything is, is pretty well known, but uh, a dispersal strategy. So not just uh, featuring, you know, a Clearwater Beach in all of our digital marketing ad advertising, but making sure that we're promoting um, all, of our, all of our beaches and su continuing to support our partners uh, with Rise to Shine safety materials. Um, and, and that's, you know, posters, masks, uh, the, the cleans, and continuing to make sure that those materials are, are provided to the cities and uh, chambers and our uh, tourism partners in the destination. So this is what this, this strategy looks like and, and what some of the rollout uh, will be. We are uh, creating an upstream communications plan. So the couple of the, the items I'm gonna touch on, the programs we're rolling out to reach people again before they arrive. This is what the expectations are when you get here, right? So A, A emphasizing the audience is not spring breakers, right? Our audience, that is not who we market to. Our audience is 35, 65, HHI over 100,000. And emphasizing again, when you arrive, this is, these are the expectations. This is how you should be visiting safely and responsibly. Um, and extending uh, those efforts into those markets I touched on that we are, we are advertising our um, uh, Immerse Your Senses campaign in, as well as holding an industry webinar to reconnect with our travel partners locally to remind them we don't need a crowded pool. We don't, you know, the mask mandate is still in place. Trying to avoid, as Steve mentioned, um, CNN or the front page of, of particular news outlets that want to fly a helicopter. Um, so, so connect, reconnecting with industry on uh, what that looks like, and then also rewarding good behavior of those who are in market. So this is th these are a couple of the efforts that we have uh, built. Um, one is, you know, every, a lot of people have heard about pledges, destinations rolled out pledges a lot last year. I think one, one aspect that was missing from that pledge was creatively motivating people to take that pledge. So, you know, if, if I'm not interested in a pledge, I'm just going to avoid it. I'm not going to take your pledge to visit safely and responsibly. What we're doing is creating a sweepstakes to attach to the pledge. So to be able to enter to win this ultimate beach day sweepstakes, you have to agree and commit that when you visit, you're gonna spread out, you're gonna mask up, you're gonna wash your hands, you're going to follow these CDC guidelines. We're confident that this is going to create um, content and a motivation for people to commit to doing the right things when they visit. We will be creating a video uh, that we'll be able to traffic on social and in these same markets where we've been um, marketing previously to again, get them to commit to taking the pledge and doing the right things when they visit. The second part of this is rewarding good behavior. As you all know, we're not an enforcement body. Uh, we can't control enforcement, but what we can do is reward those who are doing the right things. And so we're, we are going to be launching Sunshine Steward Street Teams. If you recall, we launched the Sunshine Steward video series. We're bringing that to life in street teams that will be placed throughout the destination during our peak season um, and rewarding good behavior. We'll also be creating a video that highlights and documents kind of this in action. Obviously, we have to be safe here, so proper PPP distancing and, and interacting with people in a safe way, uh, but rewarding them with um, in-destination experiences and products to push them to a local business. If they're at the pier and they're outside wearing a mask, that's not required of them, but let's reward them for that good behavior. Let's push them to Kilwins for a free chocolate or a free ice cream or something like that. So uh, we're gonna be doing that and then documenting it with content that we will then push on social and market so we can, uh, and also pitch in PR and get media coverage out of it so that upstream and, and other people can see, okay, this destination, we're thinking about doing these things the right way. So 
um, the pledge, sweepstakes, combined with the in-market do right, get rewarded uh, program, as well as the industry outreach uh, with additional materials to help equip any of our partners, restaurants, attractions, hoteliers, um, to be prepared for what we all hope to be a successful march and beyond. Um, so that's what I've got to share with you for today. Um, we will be able to share, we're in production right now, of what that video looks like for the, uh, uh, for the pledge and the sweepstakes, uh, the landing page. A lot of these materials are in production. So next TDC, we'll be able to share what all of that looks like. Some of the early performance numbers, pledge numbers that we've got, our hope is to launch that um, early next week. We did have a couple other marketing programs wrap recently. I will be able to provide uh, updates on that, Travel Zoo, Afar, and a couple others uh, next month or in March. So, any questions? Um, yes, one yeah, Doreen. question for Leroy. I think that for those of us, particularly in accommodations, but also in other businesses as well, to have the links that would be dealing with the sweepstake yeah. pledge and also um, you know the the rewards you know be on the lookout for kind of thing we can tie it to our own promotion and advertising um, which just shows that you know our destination is working hard to get the message out so if, if we could have those links to to work with as well that'd be great certainly that's a great idea I just when you said that then you know we've created posters we could easily create uh, posters for partners, uh, t potentially, or, or some type of material that is uh, take the pledge in, you know, t for your chance to win the ultimate beach day, uh, you know, even when you're in destination, because our plan is that ultimate beach day is a full on travel package with airfare, with, with everything attached to it. So, okay, you're here, but still take the pledge and you can come back. And I'm thinking, you know, we can use that in advance of their arrival by yep. getting them that information in advance before they get here to show them that it's a safe destination, but also um, there's ways for them to participate in being safe. And uh, so just a, a thought in advance. Thank you. Yeah, and that, I think that speaks to the timing and the importance of, of getting this launched now, right? As we do, the, the main objective is reaching people for, before they arrive. There, there's uh, no doubt about that. Mayor Hibbert. So we have not, uh, I'll be honest, we haven't nailed that down yet. That portion is going to be launched closer to March. Um, I don't know. No, we, we will be hiring. Um, unfortunately, yeah, we, we may have some staff, but it, it will be, I mean, to, to make sure that we get the scale and the, the presence locally, there will be using locals to help us with that effort. Can you say free drinks for those uh, non-alcoholic Yeah, I would imagine we wouldn't be uh, uh, handing out uh, a yes. yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, Risk would not appreciate that. Yeah, thought I was on, sorry. Okay, um, and then I had a question just for Russ and Doreen and Tony. What, what are you seeing in your crystal ball for the spring? <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure Tony knows more than I do on it because he's always full um, <laughs> reservations are coming in um, we still got a ways to go but I think March is looking fairly good uh, and and all of us have budgeted down we're now going to run 95 percent we're not budgeting those kind of numbers we're full on weekends because you pick up the Florida market um, but um, we're optimistic. Uh, group is not there, but it's there for the second half. It's just starting to come in. And, and the other thing that we're doing is uh, uh, with uh, group, you see that, that they come in towards the beach, or, or I'm sure with Mike also, is because they can do that function outside. And, and that's part of it too. But I'm optimistic uh, on it. Um, I think that, uh, as I heard about this program they're doing, um, the, the different police departments in Clearwater I was thinking of, 
and need to be aware of what's going on and everything because they're the key. I mean, they're the public relations most of the time and, and everything. And uh, so I've, Steve and I talked about it and how uh, um, Chief Dan needs to know what's going on from our side to help make it successful. But I like to say, as he was talking about it, is Marriott makes masks mandatory inside my hotel. When they go outside, they find their spot and they take their mask off. But it's amazing the distance they go now down on the beach or away from the pool to find their corner of it as a family. And that's really what's happening to us. And so as you were talking about this, I was thinking about how, how that's unique in finding your corner of where you want your family to be for the day outside. And uh, I'm optimistic about spring, spring break. People are tied, tied to home and they got to get away. And that is happening. Um, and it's happened. We had a, a volleyball tournament at Thanksgiving. And I'll tell you, they drove and it was family oriented. Um, and this was a high level volleyball, 70 nets. And they came, they drove from California and, and Texas and Michigans and Oklahomas and all over to participate. So they, people want to get away. Uh, if that adds to your question. But I think this is on and I think it's going to be okay. Yeah, Tony. Yeah, um, I, I think first and foremost, the, the complete loss of Canadians has had some impact on the hotel industry, but I think it's had a bigger impact on restaurants and bars because a lot of those Canadians own something down here or rented something, rented uh, whether it be a vacation rental and they're just not here. Um, I, I personally think July is probably the comeback month um, and I think that's because of the vaccines. Um, I'm very concerned about the winter season. Having said that, by March 16th of last year, my hotel just started to empty out. And I literally went from a record march to single digit occupancies in the span of three or four days. And then we made the decision to close entirely uh, in April. So, uh, you know, as one of the partners jokes all the time, we got to do better in March and April than we did in 2020. Um, but as, as Russ said, I think most of us have budgeted down substantially. Um, I, one of the things that I, I believe a lot of the hoteliers are trying to do is avoid the inevitable price war that breaks out when demand, um, when demand drops off like this. So um, it's, it's, it's hard, it's really hard to project. Um, historically, my hotel, 60 days out, I had a pretty good feel for it. Now it's within 30 days uh, and there's an awful lot of cancellations. There's an awful lot of people that get within a two week window of arrival and say, you know what, we changed our mind. Uh, we just, we're just not comfortable doing it. So uh, it's gotta be better than last year. Um, how strong is it? Uh, if I knew that, I'd, I'd be out buying hotels. I was chuckling over your comment about the crystal ball because I was thinking, well, gee, I'd, I'd, I'd like to have that crystal ball if somebody had it that was gonna give us accurate information because we are all kind of flying blind in, in the sense that you can't base it on, on prior experience. So, and it, and it changes daily from a vacation rental standpoint. Um, we've experienced the, certainly, I mean, we know there are no Canadians, so all of those bookings, those repeat people that were here year after year. Um, but, but fortunately, we've been filled with our own Southeast, Northwest, uh, you know, all of our American travelers, but people are still hesitating. They're not necessarily wanting to book and then cancel. They're, they're just kind of taking a wait and see. How is their state stacking up? How are the vaccine rollout going to affect them? Um, are they gonna be covered? Uh, so there, there's just a lot of issues. Um, from a vacation rental standpoint, we've been encouraged with the bookings that we have had that have occurred, the people who are here now. Um, but, you know, we answer to hundreds of owners as a condo vacation rental industry, not necessarily a, a corporate 
uh, owner. But by the same token, um, you know, those owners are nervous because they say, gee, we were always filled months in advance, and why are these vacancies? We're encouraged that they're going to fill in, but it's going to be with a very short lead time compared to what we've seen in the past. So we're thankful for what we've had and where we're going, and, and I, I think our marketing is is spot on to, you know, keep the message out there, and um, we're very, very fortunate and Pinellas County that we have the resources that we do and, and our destination. So we'll keep working hard. Thank you. Mike? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, echoing some of the same comments that uh, my fellow hoteliers uh, have expressed, um, I'll just share two things. Um, Innisbrook is, is fortunate that we have four golf courses and golf has really seen a resurgence. Um, uh, it's an outdoor activity that people like to partake in and, and our numbers have increased from a golf standpoint. Um, this past weekend, we had a national tournament uh, sponsored by U.S. Kids. Um, they were the top six to 16 year olds across the United States. <clears throat> we had over 300 of them playing. And it was encouraging to see the families coming from all over the states, flying into Tampa and coming to Innisbrook to have their kids play in this event. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is the, the golfers, uh, the guys' golf junkets. Um, the, the 12 guys that are coming out of a country club up north, they're not afraid to get on a plane, um, to share a rental car, to come out and then have us put them in individual carts going out. Seems a little, uh, a little crazy, but that's what they want and we're happy to do it. So we too are seeing some of this optimism, people wanting to get away, wanting to get out. But um, uh, like Tony said, I don't see it occurring on a robust manner until the back half of 2021. Um, the group market is just not there. Uh, we're, we're beginning to hear positive uh, confidence expressed by meeting planners, but we're not seeing them come through the doors and the cash registers ringing yet. Mike, I didn't mean to leave you out. I was just more beachy, so that's okay. Don't be offended. We're we're used to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really appreciate those insights. Um, you know, I, I really like the way. You know, again, I'm. I like the way we've done it. The Florida's done it. Pinellas County's done it. We've kind of tried to walk down that middle where we've tried to be as careful as we can, but also bring some survivability to businesses. I mean, I, you know, try not to deviate too much from that. And we've had a lot of support from the cities, and it's been, it's been really great. I'm glad we're targeting our, our 30 to 35 to 60 year, year old group. I want to say that was uh, 30 to 65 year old group. That's great. I'm glad to hear about the families coming with their young kids. I always feel like when the parents are here, there's control. Or if the parents come themselves with families, there's what worries me is the 18 to 24, 25 year old. So, you know, again, I don't know, you know, obviously we're, we're trying to, again, stay down that middle, keep businesses open, keep things moving. And, um, I, I, you know, I'm still nervous about that. Um, I know a lot of kids are at homes now. They're, and some have gone back to college. Some are working from, from home in college. Um, but that, that pull at that time of the year for college kids is, is I would imagine, still, still real. So um, I, I, I'm not quite sure how we deal with that. We're not marketing to it. That's a good thing. Um, but that's a real challenge. It's a, I mean, I'm telling you, I'm a real concern. Um, and so I just, again, I don't know how we deal with that, you know, in this, in this body here. I think, we're, I think we've done it through our marketing efforts really well. Um, just, just any thoughts? Yeah, Steve. If you don't mind, Mr. Chair, and I wanted to piggyback a little bit on what Leroy said, but also um, in some calls that I made around the state to some other uh, destinations to find out you know, what they're doing. Almost everybody has something on their website that talks about traveling responsibly. 
you know, whether, and then there's things that they can get from a PDF to the messaging. And it's, and it's all, almost everyone is saying the same thing, you know, got to, you know, you know, wearing a mask, being physically distant, wash your hands, follow guidelines. You, know, you have all of that. The difference that I saw was I did not see or hear from other destinations reaching out to their communities or to the visitors with a message like we're doing. So I, so I, I considered that, I mean, you know, kudos to our, our team for going through and, and going down that road because I do think that's important. In fact, when I was telling one other destination, they were like, well, God, I wish we had thought of that. Um, not that this is a competition, but you know, again, it comes back to the, to the communication aspect. And then the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, Mayor Hibbert, and this goes back to your look ahead of the crystal ball. Um, if you looked at the month of November, the time between decision to the time they actually came here was 34 days, which goes to back what Doreen was saying. It's that short time period. So if you look at March, there's folks right now that eat, you know, that decision is still being made and it's probably not going to be made until sometime, sometime in February. The other element to that is, um, and we are just now starting to see this data. And so for our next TDC meeting, um, hopefully we will have, it'll be more robust that we can go through and share, but would show what pace looks like. Um, and this is going through with travel click. Um, and you know, we have something right now that goes through and says, okay, well, here's based on what we're getting and we're pulling from all the different reservation systems, here's what we're seeing across Pinellas County in terms of occupancy um, and what that percent change might be over uh, last year. Um, so now we can go back and, and again, some of that was anywhere between down 25%, down 60% uh, by, by a given day. And so again, we're waiting on some more robust data from that, but that gives us a little bit of that crystal ball as well to know, yeah, we're not, well, until you get to the end of March, no, we're not going to be at that levels that we were at um, pre-pandemic. Uh, 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 Russ? Um, one of the things that happened last year when we reopened uh, the beaches, as you asked the question, um, the sheriff became very involved. And, and we went to beaches are open in this area, or they're full in this area. Uh, and all and so much of it I think we need to I think Clearwater PD does a good good job and maybe we need to make sure that law enforcement and Parks and Rec and the different communities along the beach know what's going on with us that somehow directly we can uh, communicate with them and uh, maybe the Sheriff's Department is the way to, to do it um, because as you are concerned about quote the college kids and all so many times it's not the people that are in our hotel. It's the, it's the people that are within 50 miles of here that are over for the day. And a lot of that's decreased over the years. And, and uh, I think that that's an area that we need to look at and, and, and not necessarily aim at the tourist um, that are playing it safe and, and have their family around five chairs out on the beach or whatever. But it's those other ones that come into the public area that get the photos taken or whatever it is. So maybe communicating more that way, maybe some program that we could do. Yeah, I know one of the things that uh, we've been working on, um, Barry and uh, the sheriff, and but also working closely with the chambers out on the beaches, uh, trying to get some of the businesses, the bars and uh, um, uh, kind of on a call to just understand a little bit where we're coming from and just to make sure we're all on the same page here because again keeping businesses open is a really big deal for them if they could just do it kind of the, the right way and it's, it's and, and it's just they're just doing things normal you know we just have to kind of try to remind there seems to be a real cooperative spirit about it um, and so I think with the with most of the folks that come down that'll be I think that's that's uh, I hate to even use the word controllable, but you know what I mean. I think people will do that. They've always they're being safe where they are now. They come here, they want to continue being safe. You keep telling these the restaurants and bars, if you're safe, you're going to get people that you may not anticipate coming back to start doing this kind of activity. If you're not going to be safe, you're going to lose some of those folks. And so we're trying to encourage it that way, so that again, I think the kids coming down, the college kids coming down last year, it wasn't so much the 
the beach thing, but it was the the out, extracurricular things, the indoor activities after hours that created a problem. And so shutting the beaches down and uh, just one of the most terrifying things that you can think about. It just it just rips at you to say those words, but tried to address the, that those folks and say, don't come down next week or the week after. We're not going to have college kids here. But that was, a, that was a time when we didn't know what was going on. I mean, we know a little bit more now, and I think there's a little more comfort level. And that's the good news. The bad news is those young folks, they're more indestructible in their minds um, because it's mostly to middle-aged middle, middle aged and older that this is really affecting. So anyway, just um, we're going to keep working that. I know that the county, county administrator is going to keep working that angle because we're going to have some kids here. We just are. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sure you uh, think uh, a lot and time-wise on, on the mandatory mask and in those uh, areas that you have in force. It does make a difference. It does bring a tourist here that are concerned and they say, I can go there because they do have it. Yeah. The message is 100% mask. Um, and that's, that's good. And I think that helps us for all the different venues in the county compared to the Californias that are just shut down right now. Yeah. So uh, that has helped us. I don't see that messaging changing a whole lot given the slow vaccination process that we're going through. And just, you know, and that continues to evolve daily. Um, so we had a great week last week on signups through the, the DOH County partnership, and we stood up three sites and it went really well from a signing up standpoint. Um, and the vaccination process started yesterday. We had a trial run on Saturday and it went really well. Um, again, we only, I think we, I think the numbers I heard this morning, we only did 1600. We can do, if we get everything set up, we could do probably between 15 and 20,000 a week at those four sites that the county and the DOH are setting up. Now that's just one of the paths that the governor's authorized. He's also authorized hospitals, you know, the, the drug, the drug stores. He's also, also he's testing publics in certain areas. And then he's picking certain situations like uh, some churches and some, um, some, some of our, some of our areas. And so, um, I think those, those separate efforts are going on, but it's just about getting more of that vaccine. The point being, I think it's going to be a while before we're talking about these things i mean i think we'd all love to get rid of these things but I, you know it's not i don't suspect that's going to be for a bit because of the vaccination process being slow so i mean i'm not complaining or you know to, about what we're doing in florida i just think it's a matter of how much we're getting to florida and uh so anyway yes Steve. If, if i might mr chair and this kind of goes back to russ you were saying i was actually on a call right before this meeting uh, with city managers from the beach communities talking about spring break um, and the and, and Barry had organized that and again talking about the messaging and the next step on that is working with communications and us with the cities to what that messaging is and how we can help with that so it goes right along the line that you were talking about Russ so I, I just wanted to throw that out okay there. Um, any any other comments before we move on. Okay, go ahead, Steve. Uh, I'm gonna move to uh, my report, uh, strategic plan discussion. On this one, it's real simple. We are moving forward um, on the strategic plan and, and my, my cry for help will be when it comes time when you get either a, uh, an email or a phone call to participate in a one-on-one -on -one sur uh, uh, survey, and, and that could be by, by phone. Um, that you find the time to, to sit with HCP. And so we've identified, we're identifying a group of folks to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. And that's gonna be critical as we lay the groundwork uh, looking ahead toward the future. The next part of that, and again, there will be an online survey as well. But if you've given the one-on-one, -on -one, there won't be an online. Uh, but when we reach out to the, the industry and the community at large, um, again, the more that we have that participate, the more robust information we get from a, from a planning purpose. Um, under economic snapshot, just real quickly, I'm not going to go through each of the stats, but overall, uh, hotel motel, when you look at what happened in the month of November compared to the 12-month average, they're roughly about the same. Occupancy was down 25%, rate was down 11%. So Tony goes back to the 
the rate you know, that you were bringing up, it's, it looks like we're going through in holding. We're not, rates not going down as much. I did want to bring up, and this came out in a story here recently, uh, Star uh, Smith Travel came out and of their top 25 markets, of which Tampa St. Pete is considered one of those markets, uh, the Tampa St. Pete market performed the best of the 25 which speaks volumes considering the, when you look at the other markets uh, that, that, are, that are in there. And I, and I think when you look at uh, for, for this community uh, compared to you know, what was happening in, in, in Tampa, I think we did better th than that average as well. So again, it's not where we wanna be, but it shows that we are making those stair steps of going, going forward. Um, on the back page of the economic snapshot, we have now started reporting information from key data, and key data was is replacing what you saw from Air DNA, uh, which really gets the vacation rental market. And again, on that one, you're looking at ADR being uh, up, occupancy being flat, just to just a, a little little bit up. And then the key figure that we always look to is uh, tourist development tax revenue. Uh, the latest number that came in was, was for the month of November, and it was down 25% as compared to uh, uh, last year. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up on Smith Travel or Star is um, on our monthly report now, if you go to the site to log in and, and look at the report, is we do have the capability of showing uh, by breakout of area in the community. So we can actually say St. Pete Beach or St. Pete, Clearwater Beach or Clearwater. Um, and it looks at all the metrics there. So we can also go back and look and see what's happening um, across different areas of the community. That is new as of uh, the, the November report. And then just uh, going through um, under general comments, uh, one is um, going through the fiscal year 22 budget process. Uh, believe it or not, we're in, is starting already. Uh, we had an, or um, I guess the budget kickoff um, and then starting that whole process. The only thing I wanted to bring to this group's attention is the timing has moved up a little bit. And so our presentation to the Tourist Development Council will probably happen in April and not May, because in May is when we have the presentation to the to the county commission. So we're, I, I just wanna get that out there. Uh, we'll make sure that take that April meeting that we get that um, on your calendar so you know exactly the date we'll have the, the presentation uh, from staff on that. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention was uh, an event that took place last week uh, when we talk about recovery, this was called Picture to Recovery. This, was, uh, this is being done in conjunction with Meeting Planners International, their foundation, is at a national level. There's a gentleman that has been involved in photography and the meetings industry for years, uh, pivoted and basically has been shooting destination uh, imagery. And what they're doing is working with MPI and they come in, they'll shoot the destination and then money of those photos that are sold actually go back into the MPI Foundation who has been going through and providing grants to members of MPI, um, especially you know, that meetings and conference industry that has been hurt uh, so much by the uh, pandemic. We were the kickoff city. Uh, so we were the, the very first one. I can tell you, I've, I've already had uh, three emails from other destinations saying, what did you do? How did you do it? How, how do I get involved in this? Um, and somebody said, well, how did they choose, you know, St. Pete to be that kickoff? Well, when the uh, CEO of U.S. Travel happens to live here, that's a plus because he was involved in it. The, uh, the gentleman that was doing all of this, uh, Chuck Fazio, um, has been here numerous times and act actually loves this area, even though he lives on the east coast of Florida. The gentleman from MPI Foundation got married here. So even though he lives in Texas, uh, so it just made sense. Uh, our team did a fabulous job of helping them. They were very complimentary of the fact that we jumped on this and made it much more than they thought it was gonna be for the kickoff. So we kind of set the bar. So I, I appreci appreciate their hard effort to go through and, and make that happen. Um, 
And Mr. Chair, that's all I would have. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, well, there's only like few of us left today, um, but um, thank you for hanging in there. Any comments around the around the table, around the room? That uh, I know you all made some, but please feel free. We got a little time. Buddy, an hour. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if it's an hour, it's an hour. I mean, it's all good. Um, anything? Um, all right. Well, I guess the next meeting is the 17th. Same place, same time, same place, and um, uh, we'll be we'll be in touch. And so, without anything else, this meeting's adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you.